Welcome to the Franchise Woman Podcast, where passion and purpose collide, profits are made, and relationships forged. I'm Rebecca Monet, CEO and Chief Scientist at Zorkel Profiles. With me today is a very special guest, Natasha Kornstein. She's the CEO of Blushington. From January 2015 to January 2024, Natasha served as the president and CEO of Blushington, a brick and mortar and digital beauty services and retail business. She led the na national expansion of the brand and their pivot from a pure play brick and mortar beauty service business to a technology driven beauty education and e-commerce platform. She continues to reinvent the business by creating the first of its kind platform for beauty professionals. In January of this year, she became the president of Blushington Holdings Inc. and led the development of Blushington Franchising. Um, the, she's got an incredible story, but I can tell you Natasha is a trusted colleague in the beauty industry and a champion for emerging beauty brands and upcoming talent. Natasha is a passionate advocate of nurturing women in business and was named as a Beauty United Mentor for Women of Color. I could go on and on. I'm just so glad you're here, Natasha. Thanks for joining us. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And I was very honored to receive the invitation to join you. Oh my gosh. Well, we had to track you down and I'm so <laughs> glad we, we did. So I want to jump right in, uh, Natasha. Um, if you had, our audience is women, primarily, right? Women interested in business ownership. If you had a piece of advice to women in business, considering going business, what piece of advice would you have for them? The advice that I give almost everyone I meet is the advice that I took myself. And it's really that your next hello can be your future. And I say that wherever you go, it might be in the grocery store line, it might be at a conference, it might be walking into a building. You never know who you're saying hello to. And my hello that I gave to someone about 14, going on 15 years ago is the reason I'm sitting in this chair today, Rebecca. And so I really have stuck with this advice. I love sharing it. And I will, uh, for all of the women with us today, I was in Los Angeles um, for a company that I worked at prior to coming to Blushington. And my publicist said, you've got to get a headshot. You're running this huge global company. And she took me to Blushington in Los Angeles. And I walked through those doors and it was love at first sight. Wow. And the very next day I went to breakfast as a courtesy to someone in New York and raved about Blushington. And lo and behold, she said, I represent them. I'll introduce them to you. We met that day over email. And today, 10 years later, I'm the CEO. Wow. Wow. Okay. I'm curious. You did the get together after the Blushington uh, experience yourself, yes. where you fell in love with the concept. What made you say yes to that invitation? Was it just trusting that person or was it just, hey, my next hello <laughs> could be my future? I, I really try. We all look, time is our most precious commodity. So we have to make good decisions with our time. But whenever I have the opportunity to meet somebody new or if somebody in my network or anyone really asks me to speak to somebody, I say yes, or I try and make it happen. You, again, you, you never know what will come out of a conversation. And I know I'm doing the talking right now, but I try to do a lot of the listening and you will always walk away from any interaction if you have the open mindset, if your ears are open, if your heart is open, you listen, you'll learn. And so, yes, I didn't hesitate to take that meeting. And the reason that we made the introduction is because I was raving about Flushington. 
So for anyone listening up today to our conversation, if you love something, if you love someone's business, if you believe in it, spread the word, share the love, because it all comes full circle. Yeah. So one of the other things that I've noticed about you, Natasha, is not only are you open to speaking to individuals, you're a phenomenal listener. In fact, pre-show, you and I were talking, you were asking me more questions than I was asking you. And I'm like, you know more about me in five minutes, you know, than most people would know in 10 years, right? So you're a phenomenal listener, but there's a genuineness to you, a, a level of authenticity that in today's world, we don't always see. Um, can you talk more about the importance of that genuineness? You really wanted to connect with me. You really wanted to connect with this individual that you went out uh, with. Tell me more about the importance of that in relationship. I, I think it started at a very young age. You know, my family came to the United States. My father was first generation and my mother um was not born in the United States. So I'm first born in, in her family. And they arrived in a community where they knew nobody and raised our family in the Midwest. And our door was always open. We would have unexpected guests for dinner if somebody needed a place to stay. You know, the, the doors were always open. So I think I was really raised with this mindset of, being open, of valuing relationships, mm -hmm. and and not seeking out relationships because I might want something in return, but seeking it out for enrichment, for learning, because again, that hello, um, you don't know where it, will, it will, where it will take you. And I'm the mother of one son. I have an 18 year old heading to college, and I've tried to instill that same open mindset, but also the genuine curiosity. And maybe that's the word, you know, to stay curious, Rebecca. I just, I think you just hit the nail on the head that if we stay curious rather than going in with an agenda, the agenda, you know, to find out if this person can introduce us to that person or if this person has something that would be helpful to me in my business or my life. You go in with no agenda. You go in with curiosity about that individual. I want to learn more about that individual. So you open up your heart, you open up your mind, uh, and you, you create a safe space for a natural relationship to begin to happen. That's what it feels like uh, as you're describing. Very much very much so. And excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but yes, I think when you're sitting in the CEO seat, as both of us are, we're making decisions every single day. Sometimes we're making one decision and I have days where I'm making 30 decisions. And the way I approach decision making, and I learned it the hard way by sometimes, you know, wanting to make that decision on my own. But I really learned, um, I really learned that the best decisions are made by gathering different points of view, by surrounding myself with people that are much smarter than me in, in many different areas. And again, coming back to curiosity and listening. At the end of the day, the decisions are mine and the decisions are consequential to the bottom line. Um, so... I do ultimately make those decisions, but before I make big decisions, I gather different perspectives and I do it quickly. You know, in today's business world, you have to be decisive. So I don't want to mistake taking other points of view with the le with indecision. You take points of view, I synthesize the information and I make a definitive decision and, and move forward. I, um, I appreciate that you made that distinction because you're right. If we're looking at too much data or getting too many people's perspective on something, we could get mired in that and become overthinkers. And I, I'm seeing more and more of that, you know, because I'm always looking at and assessing people, as you know. 
And we, we as a society have become overthinkers because of the massive amount of data that is available and we're not making the decisions. Those who are capable of listening quickly, assessing quickly and making a decision quickly are definitely gonna be our leaders, I have no doubt. I think it's really critical. I think it's, on one hand, it's such a blessing that in 2024, we have access to so much information, to so many data points, but we also can't be paralyzed uh, by all of this information and be concerned about, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? Every decision has consequences. All of us in leadership know that, and it doesn't take being a CEO. You can be, you know, the head of your household and you make a decision and you hope to make the right decision. But if you make the wrong decision or if the decision doesn't turn out, as I like to say to my team, then it's what are we going to do next? Don't dwell. You can never go back in time. None of us have the time machine. So if this wasn't the right decision. Where do we go from here? And I think it's being able to dust yourself off, move mm -hmm. forward, learn, but don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. It's it's so true. The picture I got as you were describing that is almost like, um, you know, an airplane or a laser or something. This is our target. This is where we're going. I got to make a decision today. But we're constantly making small adjustments to get to that debt. So if we overthink, we'll never get off the ground. We never, never Absolutely. get the air. You know, we can adjust as time goes on. And I'm not even sure there's a right or wrong at that point. It's just course correction, course correction, so we can get there in the most efficient way. And and it takes consistency and drive. You know, you can't be super invested and then trail off. And then it takes consistency. And you hear this, you know, I've spent a lot of time, my life by day is beauty, by night, um, I say it's a sports bar. I have a husband and son that uh, work in sports and are passionate as am I. Um, but when you talk about and really look at the histories of great athletes, there's obviously tremendous skill, but it's also about the commitment and the consistency. Yeah. So I look for the same in talent and business. All right. I, I, I want to dig deep into your leadership style. Okay. And from my understanding, you have a kind of a horizontal organizational chart, so to speak. But would you say you have always been a leader, you know, or was there something that happened or you learned that then allowed you to become a better leader? I think that I had a natural tendency from an early age to seek out and um, seamlessly go into leadership positions. But there was a particular moment in my career um, when I was rapidly rising through an organization. It was a global organization. I came in as the assistant to the CEO. I left as the global head of branding and marketing and I worked, you know, I worked like a dog, first one in, last one out, um, nose and ear to the ground and was on this very driven to keep going and going. And I remember at one of my annual reviews, I got a great raise. I got great stock options. I got a lot of praise. And I was really puffed up and sitting up like, wow. And, and then there was a but. And my boss at the time said to me, you can be a CEO someday. The only thing that's stopping you right now is you. You are in such a rush. You're in such a rush to get the idea out there, to get it executed. It has to be done, done, done you're leaving your team behind. Wow. That's not leadership. You have to bring your team with you. You have to let them see how much you care. I said, but I, I live for my team. Well, they don't know that. So wow. 
I went home that evening. It definitely brought me to my knees, you know, from flying and the promotion to you're not going to get where you want to get because of how you're conducting yourself. And it took some real soul searching. And I ultimately was very grateful that that person had the conversation with me. And I'm definitely known for being blunt. <laughs> and mm. I think it is a waste of time. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, pull the rug out. Um, but candor saves a lot of time. Candor does save a lot of time. It's an area I'm not particularly good at. Um, I tend to patty cake, you know, say it gently, say it softly. Maybe I don't have to say it. They'll figure it out for themselves you know, kind of thing. So We could balance each other out. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning. I'm, I'm learning, but it's taking therapy for me to be learning this, to be um, you know, if, if we have, by the way, again, for everyone that's with us today, if you have the opportunity to seek out therapy, whether it's in a group or individually, um, taking care of our mental health is such a huge priority. It is. It's I'm, a big, I'm a big advocate as somebody that has suffered with anxiety at different times in my life. Um, seeking out help and and not being ashamed of it, I think is really important. It is. Okay, let's let's back up just a second. You were talking about this fast tracking that you were on and this laser beam focus you had to get to a certain place in your business. You were putting in these crazy hours to achieve these outcomes that you wanted. Where the heck does work-life balance come into that? What is your belief about that? Do you think you were out of balance then? Are you more in balance today? Is that even important? So I think having priorities in life is really important. And I think that this word balance um, can be a little bit of an enemy to sanity, quite frankly. This notion that in each 24-hour period, we'll have 50% for work and 50% for family or personal, it's just not reality. So I tend to say um, to my friends and those I work with, be super clear about your priorities and then there and, and do a great job. And so with people on my team, if I have a working mom and she has a, a show to go to, go to that show and make up your work when you can. If you have that trust with your team, then it, to me, again, it's a give and take and it's a trust and you build it over time. If it's broken, then you address it. But I really believe in a give and take to allow us all to achieve our priorities in life, it makes us healthier and happier. So again, I learned that the hard way. When I first got into Blushington, someone wanted to go off and do that. Okay, we're done. No, today I have what I call an open door policy that if you meet the trifecta of excellence, excellence in your beauty services, in your sales, and excellence in the energy that you bring to our team, the kindness, the can-do mindset, then the Blushington door is open. And that has been tremendous, not only for our culture, but for the bottom line. And I'm really proud to say that at Blushington, very unusual in the beauty industry, we have retention rates five, seven years wow. of beauty professionals staying with my company. And you're right, uh, uh, for those listening, this is unusual. It is an industry <clears throat> that does have a, a challenge with retaining uh, employees and talent. Some of that is just folks that are creative and expressive that way um, do appreciate change and, and those kinds of things. Uh, but for you to be able to keep folks five, seven years and, and more says a lot about uh, Blushington as an organization and of course your leadership uh, skills that are then emulated uh, by others. So tell us a little bit more about Blushington and the services you provide 
and the changes that you have made this year, but kind of give me a big picture. Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite topics, other than my, my family, um, I could talk to you about Blushington all day long. Blushington started in 2011 in Los Angeles by our co-founder, Steffi Marin, and her sister, Nikki Marin. And the idea was really to create a destination where you could come for makeup applications. And when you think back, there, where could you go to get a makeup application? You could go to the mall and you would sit at one counter where it's about sales and their purses banging and music blaring and... It's not really about, you know, this wonderful experience, or you had to be sort of one of the lucky ones to be able to afford a very, you know, expensive freelance artist. And so Steffi found this space and said, I'm going to create a destination where women of all ages, and we have a few men, we, we love our men too, but we predominantly serve women, could come and have personalized makeup applications. Mm -hmm. When I joined the company in 2015, we then expanded upon the makeup applications um, to serve really the demands of our customers and also to keep our artists busy and learning and engaged. And so we added express skincare services. And most recently, when we reopened post-pandemic, we added blowouts. So you can have now your blowout, makeup, and skincare all in one appointment under one roof. And when we come back to where we started this conversation with time being really one of our most precious commodities, I think Blushington has really, um, is really solving this problem for, for busy women. We don't want to zigzag from appointment to appointment. We don't want to have different policies from different places. We want to go somewhere where we know that we're treasured, we're valued, and we'll walk out having been delivered great service. People always say, well, what is your business all about? We're in the beauty business, Thank but you. we're delivering confidence. Yeah. You walk out and you're standing up taller and, and that's our goal. How to make you feel like the best version of yourself. So, so um, I think this is absolutely brilliant. I remember being in Chicago and I had a very late flight into Chicago. I was speaking that next day. I looked haggard, blah, blah, blah. And there happened to be a place where I could at least get a blowout when my hair was longer. And right. it was amazing how just that one service made me feel less haggard <laughs> and more confident when I went on stage to, to speak. Um, I would have loved to have someone do my makeup. Um, unfortunately, that was not available at that time. You guys weren't in, in Chicago at the time. We uh, will be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about the the business appears to be a business where the same customer comes back again and again for his or her skin care. Um, so this isn't a wham bam transactional situation. The clients are repeat clients, right? Hey, yes, it's a great it's a great call out. We have a terrific repeat business. Um, we are generally located in areas that are convenient, not only residentially, but for business and for travelers. So we sell series for all of our different services. You can have a blowout series, a makeup series, even a faux lash series. Um, and over, I would say we're around close to 30% of our customers are series holders. So we do see great repeat business. We also serve the business traveler that's coming in and maybe feeling a little haggard after her flight and uh -huh. wants to speak. Uh, we have a lot of brides. We have a lot of proms, bat mitzvahs, weddings. Um, so it's special occasion driven, but it's also everyday life. It's Women are getting blowouts two, three times a week, for example, in our store here um, that I was just in. And so it's a combination, really. We're, we've been called the cheers of makeup. 
where people really love to come and everybody knows your name and we all really build a rapport and a relationship. And it's also just very inviting if you're passing through town or you have a special occasion. I think it's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. So tell me about the future of Blushington. Where are we going? What are the plans? Uh, you're getting more and more into technology. Tell me more about the future. So we're, we're, we're really dual pathing um, this incredible brick and mortar uh, build and as well as a technology platform. Both are in place. We have a proven track record in brick and mortar and with our technology platform. And I think what maybe I'll focus on here today with you, Rebecca, is our brick and mortar business. So in January of 2024, we launched Flushington Franchising, and I could not be more excited to share that we sold our first franchise to a long time. Yay! Yay. <laughs> yes, we, uh, we've been celebrating, and we're so I'm so proud of my team and so excited about our first franchise owner. Her name is Dr. Karen Diaz-Mike. She's opening in Boca Raton, Florida, and... Not only is she just a tremendous person and entrepreneur, but a longtime Blushington customer. So I can't think of a better endorsement than to sell a franchise to a customer that's loved the brand for years. And so as we are having conversations, um, we're being really patient and taking our time with selecting our franchise owners. They're coming into our family. We're going to be business partners. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to work with franchise owners that have shared values, that want to win, that want to bring excellence to their communities, to their guests, also to their teams. So we're looking for um, very special mm -hmm. uh, franchisees to join us. And you're going to find them like um, the doctor you were working with in Boca Raton. Um, my co-host who wasn't able to be here today, uh, her name's Tracy Kawa, is in Boca Raton. And she's all about uh, beauty and fashion. Oh, hello, Tracy. <laughs> so Tracy, you need to get down and, and uh, see the Blushington new franchisee. But I want to highlight that Blushington isn't new. You've been around many years. Yes. And what's new is now you're making it available to the uh, business owners, to a franchisee that would like to join, which then allows us to grow um, more rapidly and in areas that maybe we wouldn't have been able to do if we just did it from a corporate model. I couldn't have said it better myself, Rebecca. So that is that is what brought us to franchising. We've been around since 2011. We have built this brick by brick. We have learned and incorporated all of our learnings and reached a point where we said, we have really perfected this business model and we want to bring it all across the United States. And we don't just want to do it by ourselves. We want to put together a community of brilliant business people where we can grow together and our goal is to open 130 Flushington doors by 2028. Um, so it's an ambitious goal, but one I feel really confident about. Beautiful. All right. We're almost at the top of the hour. I hate that this conversation was so fast. Um, but talk to me about things that made a big impression. You mentioned in pre-interview a book. Um, yeah. can you share with that? Because I think this is something everyone could learn from and that it also helped you in, in learning how to be a better and better and better, uh, leader. Can you share that and what you took? Absolutely. And I hope someday to meet her, but I'll actually hold it up. Um, I keep this by my desk and I refer back to it all the time. It's called dare to serve. And it's really about how to drive results as a leader by serving other people. And as you know, you sit in the CEO seat, as I sit in the CEO seat, as we are welcoming franchise owners into our community, it's about serving. 
I serve my franchise owners, we serve our team, our customers, our brand partners. And so I really look at, it's it's called servant leadership. Mm. Um, it's a leadership style that is about incorporating um, your team along with you. And again, really my one piece of advice if I leave, leave you with is, be a power listener in your life and in business. I love that. I love it. So, um, Natasha, how would someone get hold of you if they wanted to learn about a franchise opportunity, wanted to have you on their show? Um, how would they get hold of you? I'm super easy to find. Um, you can reach us on our website at blushington.com. I'll give you my personal email. It's natasha at blushington.com. You can find us on Instagram. I'm super proud of our account. We have over 50,000 followers. Wow. You can see the great love for the brand. You can DM there um, or stop in and see me at the store. But I'm also on LinkedIn and again, super easy to reach and super eager um, to speak with your guests, um, people that are listening to us today. And my phone is uh, right here. Boom, right beside her side there. So Natasha, thank you so much for, for joining me uh, today. I, I love uh, your passion that you have. Um, and I, I'm walking away with a lot of things as you were seeing, I'm writing notes because <laughs> I'm learning a lot uh, from you. And one of the biggest takeaways for me was this idea of um, your next hello could really have an impact on your future and to go into each of those situations authentically and with curiosity rather than what am I going to take away from it. So even that, in my opinion, is service, right? You're, you're serving someone by listening to them and showing them that you value their opinion, that they are significant, that you can slow down long enough to give them uh, your time and attention. So even in that, you are, in my opinion, Natasha, serving others. Uh, so I walk away with that with a million other things. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure others will walk away with some additional aha moments. So thanks again for joining us today. Rebecca, thank you so much. And I know we're out of time. But again, for anyone listening, take the leap. Believe in yourself. You don't have to commute to a job you don't like. You don't have to feel stuck. Give a call. Have that faith in yourself and, and you don't know where it'll lead. Maybe you'll be owning your own Blushington. Exactly. All right. And thank you to those that are listening in today. Make sure to like, comment, and share uh, Natasha Kornstein's uh, interview. Uh, and of course, we'll see you next week for another episode of the Franchise Woman podcast, where passion and purpose collide, profits are made, and relationships forged. Thank you so much.